Hello, so we're going to cover the Taiping movement one more time here. We're going to talk a little bit, just review of how it got started. But we need to wind down because we need to talk about a lot of other cool, interesting things before the end of the year. We don't want to talk Taiping the whole year. Um, so recap, this would have been at the height and the glory of the kingdom. You've got Hong Xiuquan himself standing there supervising. Um, you've got the Yellow Turbans. This is often called the Yellow Turban Rebellion, right? So remembering back to how this started, a lot of it was the unequal treaties, not just that the Qing were invaders, but that the Western powers were tearing the country apart too. Who were the missionaries, uh, the foreigners that were present? You remember the three M's, missionaries, guys like this. And when we talked in the last couple lessons about James Legg and some of these guys, picture these dudes. And then we've got the mercenaries. Um, not today, but tomorrow, the next day, that's where the mercenary assignments come in. And the merchants, which we talked a lot about during the OPM time. So recap for Hong Xiu Tran, he was Hakka, which is an ethnic minority, but still Chinese. That's important in a moment here. Um, tried to take the exams. He had some kind of breakdown. Remember this, took the exam, took the exam, failed, 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 had a nervous breakdown. So you got the idea. You should know pretty well who he is by now. Okay, some more artwork here. Um, all things that we've seen. So we're looking at Hong Xiu Tran himself. There we go. I really hope that's actually a photo of him. We don't know for sure. We can't figure it out historically, but it seems like it probably was. Now we talked about Taiping being the heavenly kingdom and how they were taking the land and dividing up equally amongst the people. Um, one of you in your answer to the question said it sounded like a primitive communism. Um, there's a little bit of truth to that, although it, there are some differences too, and you'll see more of that as we get into the communism unit, which is the unit. Um, after this, we'll do the Boxer Rebellion, and then we do the communism unit after that. So you'll see more about that. Um, it goes more extreme. Once we hit the point that if you've got the whole map of China, right, and about the halfway point, there's Nanjing, which was the southern capital, the, the city that if you control it, you basically control China. Once they took that, the Taiping ideas got really carried away um, to extremes. Things like the property being divided up equally amongst the people, all that kind of stuff. They did that in the Nanjing area. At this point, you know, they had their half a million and they carried that army around and took over much of the country. Well, then <clears throat> they had many, many millions of people who joined in after that. And Taiping Kingdom was huge. And they did things like they divided according to genders. They had the women over here, they had the men over there, they were physically separated. Even married couples could not interact. That would be um, execution. They would kill you if you did. Um, except for Hong Xiu Tran, his palace was attended by women. All of his servants were women. And he was extremely fickle and picky. Um, so there was that one little hypocrisy that he and his close buddies were surrounded by women, but everybody else was not. Um, they weren't, however, like you hear in a lot of senses where the emperor is super rich and the followers are super poor peasants. Um, for the most part, the Taiping leaders, they were on board with the same stuff they were asking other people to do. And so if there were hard times and people were low on food and stuff, well, that went for Hong Xiu Chuan himself and the others as well. Um, we also know we talked about, you know, this goes into a whole slide that we won't do. There were a lot of other rebellions going on at the time. Um, why didn't the Qing eliminate the Taiping? Why couldn't they just end the rebellion? Well, for one, the Qing dynasty was falling apart. Um, for another, the foreigners were causing a lot of major official problems for the Qing dynasty. Um, it was common to have rebellions in a big country like China in those days. But if you have the British over there messing with you, you got to deal with that problem first. Um, the other thing is we saw about the Nian rebellion down south. Between that and the Taiping rebellion, the Qing were just stretched too thin. They couldn't hit it all. And more than anything, the Qing were just at this point becoming very bad at running the government. So we saw this stuff. How did Westerners view Hong Xiu Tuan and the Taiping? I think the word that we put here is that they were hopeful. They were optimistic. They thought that this would be the movement that would turn China into a great Christian nation finally, right? Like they'd been trying to do for a long time. Um, and then slowly, slowly, they started to hear more and started to realize, okay, maybe this guy's actually a little bit crazy. We saw Hosea Stout's journals, my great, great uncle, if I remember right. There might be one more great in there, I can't remember. But yeah, we saw that stuff. 
And we did a couple of lessons just barely on Hong Run Gan. Uh, he is an extremely important figure in the, the whole Taiping Rebellion. He was Hong Xiuquan's first cousin. Now, the story left off, we, we didn't finish with Hong Rangan. He makes it back to Nanjing and meets back up with his cousin. His cousin is so happy to see him. Um, he was, Hong Rangan was able to get up there in large part because of the assistance and help that he had from missionaries who were hoping that he would go and set this Hong Xiuquan guy straight and fix some of these weird ideas he had. Um, that wasn't his plan at all. But once he met back up with Taiping, um, Hong Chiltran gave him a position of power. And let's step away from the slideshow here for just a second to look at how the kingdom was set up. He named people in positions of authority and power as kings. So there's Feng Yunshan, which was one of the three original guys who joined with Hong Chiltran. He was made the South King. Then he had another guy, he made him the East King, the West King, the North King, and the Flank King. The Flank is your side that's kind of out of sight, out of mind, but very important when you're running a whole military operation, a group of cavalry, horsebacks, troops, whatever, the Flank is the side. So he was the side King. And this guy was often put in charge of protecting the rest of the kingdom through a military aspect. Later, they couldn't keep adding king after king after king on, so they started adding princes and gave them specific reasons and purposes when they did that. Um, big thing to notice then, Hong Rangan comes back, and they call him the shield king. Shield. Think like sword and shield, right? Thing you hide behind so you don't get hit by sword. Um, he was called the shield king. So what happened at this point is Hong Chiltran, he was really good at getting a good old rebellion started. And a lot of rebellion leaders are, but that doesn't mean he was necessarily good at running the government after he, he did that. We saw that many times, you know, with our dynasties that we looked at, it was easy to be the first emperor. It was hard to be the second emperor because you didn't just have to conquer. You had to run the country at that point. So that was kind of what was going on here. Hong Chiltran, not so good at this running the country thing. So he takes Hong Rangan, who we know is extremely intelligent, who has been spending time studying things like science and engineering and economics while he's killing time and waiting to be able to go catch up to the Taiping. So Hong Chiltran recognizes how intelligent and useful his cousin can be, and he puts him in place as the Shield King. Now, the Shield King is significant for a couple reasons. One, he was a shield for Hong Chiltran. So Hong Chiltran is here, right? His cousin is here protecting him and in front of him and defending him. If you wanted to go to Hong Chiltuan, you had to get through the Shield King, Hong Rangan, first. So that, that's the amount of power that he was given. Okay, back to the presentation here. There's going to be a quiz question on that one, by the way. The Shield King, for sure. Okay, so there's Hong Rangan. Um, we know that he studied in Hong Kong for a long time. All the foreigners liked him. He learned a lot of English in that time, a lot of English. Um, made him the Shield King. If anybody talks to the Taiping, they have to go through him. This was all covered on a previous lesson. Okay, so now one thing that um, made Hong Rangan a little bit different is what did he want to do? He was the first person that we know of who ever spoke of China as being a superpower. That's why we're talking here. What does it mean to be a superpower? Industrialized nation. We're not relying on peasants to make all of our stuff. We start building factories, right? He wanted to have railroads, insurance companies. The insurance company would be like for farmers. So let's say you have a drought and some really bad weather one year and all your crops die. What do you do? You starve to death, right? Well, with an insurance company, you pay a little bit of money every week or every month into that. What happens if there's a major event and your crops all die? You get a check from the insurance company that you can use to buy food. So things like that. Banks, they wanted that. A safe place to keep gold where you could get money issued. Free trade. He wanted to not have to go through the government for all the trade deals with other countries. Friendly diplomacy. Instead of these opium wars and stuff that have been going on, he wanted to establish relationships with other countries 
on a friendly basis, embassies, instead of just treating them like the foreign, you know, barbarians that wanted to come and they could be tribute or they could leave, right? With the Qing, but not this guy. Hong Rong Han is saying, no, give them an embassy. They're a country just like we're a country. Let's negotiate. Um, patent laws. If somebody invents something, he wanted to protect it. Okay. And this was good. This, this came from the Shield King, from Hong Rangan, and this was actually functional government stuff. Remember the biggest reason the Qing were losing to the Taiping? They were losing because they weren't good at running their government anymore. Well, here we've got a guy who has some good ideas on how to run it. Okay, now he wanted to publish his ideas, put them in book form, and tell people about what he was going to do. Hong Xiu Tren wanted him to put this as like religious propaganda more of the talk of like, let's rid China of the demons and stuff like that. But he started more and more to sneak these ideas into the propaganda that he was passing out. So it wasn't just ideas of craziness and um, extreme religious ideas. It was ideas about, hey, we could transport goods across the whole country if we had a railroad, you know, like they do in Europe and America and that kind of stuff. He squeezed that into the messages that they were printing and sending out. And pretty soon they stopped even talking about the religious stuff and all the pamphlets and brochures that were going out, they were just talking about um, ideas, politics and ideas that they could use to run the government. Um, he believed that if they didn't have foreign governments to help them, they wouldn't survive. So one of the Taiping's highest priorities was to get the other governments to step in and be friends with them. He liked the British and he liked the Americans. He liked them probably because he knew so many of them. He liked the Americans because he, because he felt that they were like the Taiping. They were Protestant Christians for the most part. They were a big, aggressive, um, new government. And that's kind of how he felt that they were too. Let's see. So they, they kind of also changed their approach here a little bit. Um, they decided that they weren't anymore going to try to rid China of the, the devils, they decided that they were going to just try to win the war um, by becoming a second country. They stopped trying to say, let's take over the Qing. They said, you know what? The Qing can keep existing, but we are China now, and we'll set up our own government that will be just as powerful, and we'll keep them at bay. All right. Now, we'll have an assignment here on this guy shortly. Um, and we'll come back to them. So for now, there's going to be a few questions you can answer about this lecture that we just did. And then there's going to be more detail on Zhang Guofan soon. As soon as I can stop the video. It's a little laggy. <laughs>